Good morning. We are going to begin with general questions, and our first question is from Angus Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of businesses and domestic properties in the Falkirk East constituency can access superfast broadband and what percentage are connected? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, independent broadband analysis site Think Broadband states that 96.6% uh, of all premises in the Falkirk Council area are able to access superfast broadband speeds of 30 megabits per second or better. The latest Ofcom figures from, February, uh, sorry, from December 2018 for the Falkirk East constituency show that 89% of all small and medium-sized enterprise premises and 96% of domestic premises have access to superfast broadband of 30 megabits per second and above. And Ofcom figures also suggest that 62% of all lines in the Falkirk Council area have an active fixed broadband connection in excess of 30 megabits per second. This information is not available at the constituency level. Angus I thank the Minister for that answer. The, the Scottish Government deserves full credit for providing superfast broadband to communities who would have fallen behind had it been left to the UK Government to get their act together. Despite this success, however, rural communities within my constituency, particularly in Avon Bridge, have faced severe delays and are still without access to the superfast network. Around 12 properties face the prospect of having to wait for R100, including businesses reliant on the best broadband available, having originally been advised that superfast broadband would be available to them some two years ago or more. These issues have been compounded by a lack of co communication from contractors, misinformation from project literature and websites causing frustration, confusion and anger in these communities who feel they have been left high and dry, while other communities very close by surge into the digital future. Can the Minister therefore provide reassurance that R100 will learn from the issues faced in rolling out the DSSB programme, ensuring that better, more effective community engagement is at the heart of the R100 programme? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Well, firstly, can I uh, recognise, especially given the applause from the Conservative benches, that, uh, that uh, broadband matters, as are all telecoms, are actually reserved to the UK ministers. But as, as Mr Macdonald knows, um, we are very, very much, rec much recognising that, indeed, I'll, if the member wants to ask a question in this parliament, I'll certainly answer it. But Mr Macdonald will recognise that um, uh, the, the issues that he raises in respect of his constituents are ones we, we very much acknowledge. And we are certainly unhappy to hear that members of, uh, of, of Mr Macdonald's constituency have been led to believe they're going to get super fast broadband and haven't had that. Now, there are a number of complexities around the interaction between the commercial investment plans of operators and the, uh, the, the public sponsored uh, projects such as DSSB, which we are very proud of in terms of uh, those uh, state interventions such as the Scottish uh, Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme not being able to intervene where there's commercial plans. And they, that means there's some interaction between the, the uh, two programmes of like commercial investment and the publicly funded investment. And that can present some difficulties in understanding exactly which properties are going to be covered. But as the member knows, uh, we have committed uh, to a 600 million pro programme under R100, which I hope will deal with the properties in Mr Macdonald's constituency. But if you would like to let me know which ones they are, I can give a more definitive answer. But I do reassure him we have learned very much from the DSSB process and are trying to avoid some of the communication difficulties he describes and make sure that we are work very, very much from the start of R100 to try and give as much clarity as we can to communities about when uh, services will be delivered in their area. Question number two, Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to raise awareness of the Apologies Scotland Act 2016 since it came into force on the 19th of June 2017. Minister Ash Denham. Uh, the Scottish Government expect public bodies and other organisations to be aware of the current legislative framework and to update their procedures and guidance accordingly. The Scottish Government did not commit to issuing general guidance on the basis that to do so would risk interpreting the law, and that is obviously the job of the courts. Given that the Act is not retrospective and applies only to legal proceedings commenced after the 19th of June 2017, it may be premature to look for any practical content that courts may have added to the legislation. Uh, I thank the, the Minister for that reply. Will she consider launching an information media campaign, possibly to be done using the government's digital presence, Facebook, um, etc., targeted at solicitors, local government, businesses and the general public to raise awareness um, about the Act? And if so, will she initiate research on the uptake uh, before and after the, the campaign to establish its effectiveness. Minister. 
I thank the Minister for raising that point, and I can see, uh, Minister, the member for raising that point, and I can see that uh, where the member is driving with that is more of a, ge a guidance of more of a general nature rather than of a, um, particularly of a legal nature. So the Scottish Government are working closely with the um, Interaction Action Plan Review Group, and it's anticipated that they will consider reparations including um, apology, acknowledgement, support and commemoration this year and next. And that is likely to include consideration of how information about the Apology Scotland Act 2016 and its benefits can best be communicated. Um, I will take uh, the member's point about a media campaign and so on, and I will look at that and I will come back to the member once I've considered it. Thank you. And question number three, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the comments in its China engagement strategy regarding respect for human rights and the rule of law, what discussions it has had with the Chinese consulate regarding the recent protests in Hong Kong? Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the recent protests show the strength of feeling among the people of Hong Kong who have exercised their rights to freedom of speech and assembly as guaranteed in the joint declaration. The Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation discussed the protests in Hong Kong with the Chinese Consul General at a recent engagement. He has since written to the Consul General outlining the Scottish Government's position that it is vital that Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and the rights and freedoms set down in the Sino-British Joint Declaration are respected in full. Ross Greer. Thank you. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks and the fact that a Scottish Government Minister has engaged with the Chinese Consul on this. Two million people out of a population of seven million in Hong Kong came out to protest and were yet again met with batons and tear gas by their own police force. That tear gas was manufactured by a company called Kemring, based in the UK, and in receipt of hundreds of thousands of pounds of uh, money and enterprise grants from the Scottish Government. Given that the First Minister has previously confirmed in this chamber that the Scottish Government is interested in helping arms dealers transition into what was described as the blue light sector, i.e. the equipping of police forces, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm if supplying, if funding the companies that are arming police forces like those in Hong Kong is part of what the Government had in mind, and if so, how on earth that's compatible with this Government's commitment to human rights? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the plant at Stevenson does not produce tear gas. Uh, a grant of 160,000 uh, was given to uh, Chemring in 2013 to help modernise the company's site at Stevenson in North Ayrshire, helping to secure 13 permanent full-time jobs at the site. Question number four, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made with the inquiry into the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, since their appointment, the co-chairs of the Independent Review have consulted extensively with experts and established systems for stakeholder contact. In line with the Britain Report recommendations, at a meeting today, they will publicly present the preliminary terms of reference and ask for feedback, and they will consult on those. They will also formally seek submissions of evidence and launch the review's website and contact details. This is all important because it is critical that a wide range of views and information is considered. Michelle Ballantyne. I thank that Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but given that on the 9th of July next month, the Royal Sick Kids in Edinburgh is due to open, and given that it shares the same design concept and is being built by the same contractors, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me if she has received assurance that the same issues will not be experienced? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, as Ms. Ballantyne, I'm sure, will know, it's certainly a reply I've given before in this chamber. Um, uh, NHS Lothian for the Royal Sick Kids in Edinburgh and uh, other uh, boards where we have new buildings, for example, uh, in Orkney, uh, were all tasked with making sure that they had the proper assurance from the immediate lessons that we had learned with respect to Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in terms of air ventilation and water supply and the use of, for example, sinks, that they had applied that in terms of the design and the construction. We have that assurance and indeed uh, that was uh, one part of the reason why NHS Lothian did not take ownership of the site until it was absolutely assured that those steps had been put in place. And Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Queen Elizabeth University Hospital is one of Europe's largest, with 1,100 patient rooms, 14 floors high, and built on the site of the Southern General. Why is that acceptable for Glasgow, but not acceptable for our hospital in Monklands, which the Cabinet Secretary has just slapped a closed order on this morning? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 
Well, what a pity that Ms Smith didn't actually read the answer to that GIQ that was issued this morning. I have not slapped a closed order on Monklands Hospital. What I have repeated uh, is this government's commitment, absolute commitment, to uh, source a replacement for Monklands Hospital. What I have ruled out is making that replacement on the current site for a number of reasons set out in that GIQ, but let me give you some of them. There is no uh, room around the existing hospital to build a new hospital. To build a new hospital on that site would require the demolition of the current hospital. The current hospital's capacity could not be picked up in the rest of Lanarkshire. Therefore, patients would wait longer for the treatment they, they need. I'm sure if that happened, Ms Smith would be first on her feet to criticise that. There is also an issue of patient safety. If you construct a new build alongside an operating hospital with that proximity. So that is the case. What I have done, what I have done is required NHS Lanarkshire to ensure that their consultation on a range of options, including making sure that new options that maybe uh, have come forward in the most recent period are included, that that consultation is from the very beginning, one that involves the local communities that the Monklands Hospital serves, that ensures that the design that the clinicians have so well led for a new hospital continues to be applied in any new build, and that they take forward all of this with some uh, speed, but making sure that the local community's voices are well heard and they are part of the decision making before it comes to me. Those are the facts, presiding officer, and yet again I would appreciate if Scottish Labour would stick to the facts instead of making it up as they go along. Question number five, Willie really Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to maintain Scotland's participation in the European digital single market, which is estimated to be worth 400 billion euros in light of the UK government's reported intention to withdraw from it. Minister Kate Forbes. Well, I recognise the value of access to the digital single market with tech already a fast growing sector in Scotland. Um, it would be a, a deep shame that Scotland misses out on the emerging opportunities of being part of the European single digital market and Brexit will have a detrimental impact on Scotland's digital businesses as they face increasing trade costs if UK and EU legislation diverge. Billy Coffey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? President officer, the situation with the digital single market, it's akin to a luxury €400 billion Euro pound cruise liner sailing off into the sunset and the UK sitting in a tugboat at the jetty wondering whether to try and follow it or not. One minute the UK was fully behind in leading this plan and the next we're waving goodbye to it, to the horror of IT companies right across Europe. If we don't follow, then roaming charges will be back, shared digital services and access to IT procurement contracts will be seriously restricted. Can the Minister give us some assurance that Scotland's reputation for world-class IT innovation and developments will be protected and that we will seek to maintain our links with Europe as this market develops in the future? Minister Kate Forbes. Well, that is why the Scottish Government put forward a comprehensive set of positions for us to remain part of the digital single market. We've engaged with the governments across EU member states and despite Mr Hunt's recent interventions, we'll continue to engage strategically with our European partners. And as Scots head off on holiday and perhaps some people in this chamber as well to EU countries, we will benefit from surcharge free roaming. In a no-deal scenario, that would no longer be guaranteed. So we cannot have an outcome of EU exit that puts Scottish citizens and businesses at a disadvantage as we are just beginning to reap the benefits of a fast-growing tech sector. Question 6, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on SEPA classifying the seawater at Fisherow and Musselburgh as poor in 2018-19 and the potential impact that this has on tourism and the health of people bathing in the area. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of good bathing water quality for bathing and tourism and any poor classification is unacceptable and must improve. Together with SEPA and Scottish Water, the Scottish Government is taking all possible steps to raise bathing, uh, bathing water quality and this includes public sewer network improvements and fixing property misconnections. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. What further specifically can the Scottish Government do to help East Lothian Council manage this situation and is there a time frame to completion? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government has provided £340,000 to fund a joint programme 
of intense sewer investigation for Fishero and Portobello to identify and fix sources of pollution from property misconnections. Scottish Water is also currently carrying out improvements to the sewer network. The Scottish Government and SEPA provide support for East Lothian Council through the Edinburgh and Lothian's Bathing Waters Stakeholder Partnership Group and the government-funded Keep Scotland Beautiful, My Beach, Your Beach initiative provides support to East Lothian Council to reduce the impact from litter, dogs and gulls on Fisheroy Sands. Question number seven, Annabel Ewing. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle animal cruelty. Minister Marie Goujon. The Scottish Government is committed to the highest possible animal welfare standards and we are taking forward legislation on animal sanctuaries and the breeding and sale of dogs, cats and rabbits and licensing of pet shops. We expect to announce in September the timing of that legislation to increase the penalties for cruelty offences and to allow animals seized to protect their welfare to be quickly rehomed. We're planning a follow-up public awareness campaign on the risks of buying puppies and we're also working to establish an animal welfare commission to provide expert advice on future issues. Annabel Ewing. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer and uh, the Minister will be aware of the increasing calls indeed for a five-year maximum sentence to be available for the most serious cases of animal cruelty as opposed to the current maximum of 12 months. Can the Minister confirm that she is indeed sympathetic to those calls and that in the legislation that she is referring to that will be a provision that will be part of that bill. Minister Marie Goujon. I am, uh, I can confirm that because the proposals for increasing the maximum sentence for the worst cases of animal cruelty, including the attacks on service animals, were consulted on as part of the Scottish Government's commitment to amend the Animal Health and Welfare Act 2006. Now, we published the responses to that consultation on the 10th of May, um, and the analysis of those responses will soon be published as well. And we expect to be able to make an announcement about the timing of that legislation uh, in the programme for government in September. Question number eight, Peter Chapman. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the use of patrol boats at Rockall in response to Irish fishing vessels. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, Marine Scotland continues to monitor and gather evidence regarding fishing activity at Rockall. However, we do not discuss specific details on the deployment of surveillance assets. Our aim is to resolve this issue through discussions with the Irish Government. Peter Chapman. I thank the uh, Minister for that answer, but I'm disappointed by it. We have seen a major increase in Irish fishing vessels within the 12-mile limit around Rockall from 15 incursions in 2014 to 94 in 2017. And even two Irish international maritime law experts agree this is illegal and should be stopped. What enforcement action has been taken? Have any Irish vessels been boarded and checked? And if not, why not? Cabinet Secretary. As I said, we continue to monitor the situation. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the specifics of deployment of surveillance assets, but it is important that we address this issue as we have been doing for some time. And indeed, the figures that he has quoted are the figures that I proactively gave this chamber when I answered a previous question. Question number nine, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis the Transport Secretary has carried out regarding how the proposed workplace parking levy could affect disabled people access and employment. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government has not carried out this analysis. The Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee agreed John Finney MSP's amendments to the Transport Scotland Bill on workplace parking levies on 19th of June. These amendments include a national exemption for blue badge holders and a requirement for any local authorities that choose to develop a workplace parking levy proposal to carry out impact assessments. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the uh, Minister for his answer, but would you recognise that many disabled people do not have blue badges? Um, they have hidden disabilities, they have upper limb disabilities, and they will be included in this tax. Will he stop and look again before this bad piece of legislation is passed? Minister. Well, I, I certainly recognise Mr Balfour's concern, uh, but we, we encourage people who think they're eligible to apply for a blue badge to do so, and I certainly encourage members to, to encourage that to do. But secondly, the, the charge is levied on the occupier, not individuals parking, and therefore be for the employer to consider the needs of its employees. And this is one of the variables in developing a scheme that would be obviously the decision of the local authority to take forward and that they undertake an impact assessment to make sure they are uh, taking account of the needs of disabled uh, customers. Question 10, Adam Tompkins. 
Um, to ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed maintenance of the Clyde Tunnel with Glasgow City Council. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Excuse me, presiding officer. Um, <laughs> the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, Michael Matheson, MSP, met with Glasgow City Council on the 11th of June to discuss a number of transportation issues affecting Glasgow, including the maintenance of the Clyde Tunnel and its approaches. Adam Tompkins. I uh, uh, thank the Minister for that answer. The Clyde Tunnel faces an annual funding shortfall of some £775,000. Major structural work is required to keep the tunnel open, which is used by 64,000 vehicles every day. What support is Transport Scotland offering to Glasgow City Council to ensure that the Clyde Tunnel remains open and is safe? Minister. Rec I very much recognise, Presiding Officer, the strong interest in this issue. The Clyde Tunnel and its approaches form part of the local road network and, as such, responsibility for maintenance rests with Glasgow City Council. However, uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has instructed his officials at Transport Scotland to work with Glasgow City Council to explore the issues and costs associated with maintaining this important section of road.